Denizens of the Interwebs. This is Double V, and this is another drop in a log. This time we're going to talk about, as promised before, an issue that is the source of heated debates everywhere. Whether it be on a forum or a chat room, you'll see it creep up from time to time. Whenever a new game comes out or is coming out, people are talking about the hype. Oh, what's the pay model going to be? Is it going to be free to play? Is it going to be subscription based? Is it going to be buy once? This usually sparks a lot of debate because somebody is going to complain regardless of what pay model the game uses. And from that complaint, the flame war begins. So I'm going to go over the pros and cons of common payment methods. And we'll try to make some sense of all this in the end. I'll try to keep it brief because this is actually an issue that could go on for ages. It's rather complex. You know, we could get down to all kinds of business models and terms, but I think we'll just stick to the basics here. So yeah, let's kick it off by talking about free-to-play. Now on the one hand, free-to-play is awesome. It's by far the best in one way, and that is that it's free. Who wants to pay when they don't have to? Who would rather pay than not pay? Well, some people, and we'll get into that later. But yeah, I mean free. Free's always good, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe not. Why is that? Well, Let's start off with a basic fact about free games. With the exception of all but very few, these games aren't really free. Many of these games cost millions of dollars to develop, and they've got to make that money back and then make money as a business. That is not going to be all the way done through advertisements. Now, some cheaper production games that are truly free do this, but the big uh, productions always have a way for you to pay. And this is right away where people start to have doubts about free-to-play games because of the things that they decide to make you pay for or let you pay for even. In some games, you pay for basic little things like an extra bag or a respec, things that should have already been in the game. I almost think at that point, it should have just been a subscription game. If, you, if you're going to make me pay for the basic little necessities that make up the core of the game, you, you should have done it with a subscription to begin with. And while it can be hard to get past that, most people do, they'll pay for the little stupid things. Or they'll play free without those things and complain about it. But that's not even the worst one. Now, some games go the extra mile, and they say you can play as much as you want, but if you pay, we're going to let you have all kinds of stuff that makes you overpowered. This is widely known as pay to win. Now pay to win has a positive and a negative side, believe it or not. On the one hand, if you suck at the game and you have money and you don't mind paying for the game, then you can go through a period of ownage by paying for the game. And it's always fun to own for a little while. Eventually, you'll realize that you have an unfair advantage and things are not as fun anymore. The more fulfilling long-term aspect is when you earn it, which can also be a positive aspect to pay to win. People who want to be extra hardcore and earn their way can do so against people who have an unfair advantage by simply playing the game for free and playing against all the pay-to winners, you could be extra hardcore if that's your thing. However, this leads into the negative aspects of pay to win, which of course is, well, some people have an unfair advantage. A level playing field is always going to produce the least amount of controversy. And pay to win games don't have it. I mean, that's that's as simple as it gets. It's not a complex issue really. There are more appropriate ways they could have charged for the game. Because let's face it, when you're a game publisher, you don't want people complaining about your service, even if they are free players. They are potential customers. But, you know, a lot of times, you don't want to go totally pay-to-play, because then you lose 
you know, some people who would have just been casual players, maybe they'll drop a few bucks every now and again. The free-to-play models are much, much more accessible to casuals. That being said, the let I'll pay a little bit every once in a while method can actually become a lot more expensive, especially if you're not casual. You might wake up one day finding that the monthly fee would have been a lot less expensive and you're just throwing money at this game all the time. And that is the case for a lot of people. And a lot of people just have money to throw around and they spend a lot on the game. These aren't people who participate in this debate. It's the people who actually know the value of a dollar that have an issue with the payment models. Another good thing about free-to-play games is the large sense of community that they can generate really, really, really fast. Because it's free, one little advertisement will get lots of people to come check out the game. And you'll find that the free-to-play games typically have a lot more people in the noob zones and whatnot. This is especially true in the games that are free all the way around the board, provided that they're still a good game. Now, of course, the free games that have no payment options whatsoever and are totally free runoff of advertisements or whatever it may be, they typically suffer from a lower production quality, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad game. A game can have good mechanics and gameplay with a low production quality. It's entirely possible, and they do exist. Uh, but for some people, the production quality is square one for getting them to even want to play the game. You know, for the most part, you can tell a AAA game when you see it. It's usually got good graphics, the interface looks polished, it's got their features lined out, they got a nice trailer for it, you know, it's the whole experience that they try to push on you. AAA titles are free to play these days sometimes. It's becoming an increasingly more common thing. You know, no longer does free to play mean bad quality. But that leads me into the first thing I want to talk about as far as pay-to-play games. And that is, the quality is usually more consistent on pay-to-play games. Pay-to-play games have a huge obligation to put out a top level of quality. Now, just like I said with a low quality, doesn't necessarily make it bad. A high production value doesn't necessarily make it a good game either. we found many times that these high AAA titles just don't grab people like they should. They're not as epic in the end game as they were in the beginning of the game, get you all psyched, or even the hype that came before it with dev interviews and crazy trailers and whatnot. Sometimes it doesn't uh, continue to provide that level of entertainment through the entire game. A lot of people are pissed off about this. You know, they, they want their pay-to-play games to be engaging forever, basically. Which is interesting. I, you know, I don't happen to play games for years and years and years. I like to switch games around. You know, variety is the spice of life and whatnot. But some people want to find their home. And they think when they do a subscription game that they probably found a new home. And when they get to the end point of the game and it starts to suck ass, they're disappointed. Like, what happened? It only took me two weeks to get here. And I got two weeks left, I don't even want to play it anymore. Or even worse, I signed up for a year subscription and now I'm really fucked. So, you know, the quality doesn't necessarily make a good game. However, there is a content-related bonus to pay-to-play games, and that is that you get all the content. Like I mentioned about these free-to-play models, a lot of times they bait you, you know, with the free stuff. And to really continue on, you have to buy, you have to continue buying little things. DDO is a big example of this, and I think it's a good model, and I'll talk about that later, but some people are really, really annoyed with that type of model. They don't get it. And if you don't get it, stick with me, because I am going to talk about why that is a good model uh, at the end of the video. But other than content consistency, one of the things that people have an issue with on pay-to-play games is the simplest possible fact that it costs money at all. Some people really want to play free games. And I personally don't understand this, but I still can't argue that costing money is better than not paying any money. Of course, I would rather have it free. 
I'm just smart enough to see past why that doesn't really work. Still, it is an issue with some people, and worth mentioning here. Another good thing about pay-to-play games is that typically there's an even playing field. Now we talked about the uneven playing field that can exist in free-to-play games, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Everybody paid for the same stuff, everybody's on a legit playing field, it's all up to your uh, skill and interpretation of the game as to whether or not you're going to win. Now this doesn't address design issues like gaming balance, like I said, it's up to your interpretation of the game. Finding the stuff that's imba and exploiting it, or being the uh, noble person and not using the imba stuff because that's cheating, that doesn't have anything to do with this conversation. The fact is though that on both the subscription based and the pay once models, you're typically on a very even playing field and there's no pay to winery going on. However, now that I've brought up the pay once models like Guild Wars 2 uses, I find that this sort of model can sometimes feel like a cash grab to people because, especially with pre-orders, like you hype up the game, everybody pre-orders it, you start playing and the game blows. And then you're like, well, what do I do now? They've already got my money. You know, they win. And there will be pay once cash grab kind of games like that. Some people say the Guild Wars 2 is like that. I don't agree. I think Guild Wars 2 is a very well-developed game that innovates in a lot of good ways. And I think everything they do in that game is legitimate. And they're legitimately trying to make a good game. Your reasons for liking and not liking it really, at the end of the day, have nothing to do with the payment model. But a lot of people didn't end up liking Guild Wars 2 that much, and they continued to play it a little bit more because they f wanted to feel like they were getting their money's worth. And both the buy once and the subscription-based games suffer from this. A lot of people keep playing for the rest of the month, or they keep playing forever, just on the notion that they've b put money into it now. It's easy to feel this way. It's easy to feel committed to your investment, even if you're not having that much fun. And I've seen a lot of people say stuff like, well, I've got 10 days left. We'll, we'll keep doing raids. Or, I just paid 60 bucks for this game. I better at least give it a shot. Hell, I did that with SimCity. I bought SimCity. I really haven't had a chance to play it that much. The few times that I did play it were basically just out of pity for myself that I actually paid money for the damn thing. Even the free game that I got from uh, them screwing the servers all up, I didn't even play all that much. Played it for like 20 minutes, Dead Space 3 I got. Hardly played it, hardly touched it, hardly touched SimCity. Money down the toilet, and I sort of feel like... I'm obligated to at least try it a little bit because I did pay money for it. This is an alluring aspect of especially the subscription based games because if you get tired of it halfway through the month you feel obligated to keep playing maybe by the end of the month you'll like it again and you'll continue to subscribe and a lot of people go through this cycle many many times and it is certainly an issue. Now one other advantage of a pay-to-play game, and some people are going to agree with this with smiles and joy and jumping up and down, is that there's less little kids in the game, typically. A lot of little kids don't have credit cards. Their mom and dad won't buy them shit. Especially not online. Now that's changing. People are starting to trust online transactions more and more. But, um, you know for the most part, pay-to-play games have less little kids than free-to-play games. You go on a free-to-play game, there's little kids everywhere. And they're usually really annoying. They're the real nonsensical trolls that you run into all the time. The ones who are definitely trolling, but they're not really that funny or innovative at all. And then if they're not trolling, they're probably not even that good. It depends on the complexity of the game. In some of the simpler games, kids get really good at Twitch based games I find uh, but in the more complex games the little kids are the fall of many a party and 
I mean, they can come in. It doesn't have to be a free game. They even come in on games that have a trial or games that have a pseudo free to play model where you play kind of like a demo period almost not a trial but you can play as long as you want you're just locked off from any higher end content ddo has this i think again i'll say it's a good model for its reasons uh but it does let a lot of little kids in however you know by switching to pay to play you don't only lose little kids you do lose a lot of adults who simply don't want to fork the money out right away for a game they don't know anything about. If a game doesn't have a trial or a demo style pay structure like DDO has, then they'll never even try the game. You do lose a lot of potential customers by strictly being pay to play. There at least needs to be a little balance in there. And I find that you know, companies can do this without gambling too much. Now, we know free-to-play is a gamble, but is a subscription-based release any safer? Like I just said, you don't know how many customers you're going to reach. Now, of course, the publishers do their homework. They have advanced projections and whatnot. But at the end of the day, you got to hold your subs and you got to make sure you're getting new subs for the ones that leave. And it to me, it's just as much of a gamble as the free-to-play games. Now, of course, in a free-to-play game, you don't know if you run into a very... It's actually a very similar problem. You just don't know if these people that show up are going to pay any money. Just like on the pay-to-play subscription, you don't know if the people that show up are going to continue to subscribe. Now, I do remember seeing... I think it was on MMOBomb.com. They showed that numbers of a lot of free-to-play cash shop style games they're making a lot more money even than the subscription based games do that doesn't make it any less of a gamble but the stats say wow the gamble's paying off for some people but really you can meld these two things together and minimize your gamble and make almost everybody happy by using a model I don't know what I would call it I guess I'll call it an unlimited demo model where you can play the game and you can play through a good portion of the game, you know, the beginning of the game, and you can play that beginning of the game as long as you want, as many times as you want, and the only thing is to continue, you need to subscribe or to continue, you need to buy something. Not only do I find this to be fair, but I find this to be a really good model because you get people hooked and they want to buy something. You don't lose people by charging them right at the door. You let them check the game out and by the time they get to a certain point and they're totally addicted to the game, they're going to want to buy the subscription package. To me, it simulates the seemingly lost art of the game demo, which I'm seeing less and less these days. I mean, it seems like hardly any games have game demos anymore. And it was a great, great thing. You know, DDO, to me, kind of spearheaded this model. Or Turbine did, you know, the publisher of, of DDO. You can play a pretty good portion of the game, to be honest. And then, when you get to the advanced stuff, you need to subscribe or you need to buy the expansion packages now this does still suffer you know in their case to spending too much you can definitely spend too much on that game so I would say future games you need to use this model but don't make it to where people are gonna break the bank although you might make a buck you know people end up feeling bad about paying you money I think the last thing you want in the world is for your customers to feel bad about paying you money. I'd say make your prices fair, make it so that people can only pay a fair price, and I think you'll have continued customer bases. You know, I'm not a business expert, but that's just out of my logic what I think. And I think that pretty much wraps up at least my debate about uh, free-to-play versus pay-to-play. I don't know if we came into any conclusion as to what's better. I mean, really, I'd say the best one is the one that I've just mentioned, the mix between the two. 
and I think as usual middle ground and balance is going to win the day on this one. But uh, Pulse to me, what, what do you think about this? Did, did I miss anything important? I probably did. Or is there a model out there that I'm not really aware of that is better than these? Or do you have an idea for a brand new model that doesn't exist yet? You know, this is a good place to discuss that. And if I get a good discussion here, I might do another drop in a log later about uh, what happens in this discussion. So anyway, without uh, further wasting of your time, double V out.